Hello and welcome to Snell's Law. It's the last of our uh, light laws for a little while, so I put my colourful uh, light dispersion shirt on just to prove the point. And here we go with Snell's Law. Snell, great law, very easy to do at home. Snell is generally great as long as it's not being shouted at you by a Nazi stormtrooper. And all we're really going to need is a light source, which I have uh, carefully arranged so it gives us a beam of light instead of the... Uh, Full pen. And I'll tell you how to do that in a moment. Some uh, scissors, which not just used for cutting, but it's also going to have another interesting function. Sellotape, straight edge, a knife. Always good to have a knife in these dark times. And uh, some sort of glass block. Now these are two shelves from a cabinet, bathroom cabinet. But um, anything you can use. Uh, actually, there might be something you can use in your house, come to think of it. Of course, the other thing you can use is a fish tank. Any of you lucky enough to have a fish tank, lucky enough to have a fish tank, you don't even need the fish. You just need a large, flat-sided water container. And if you notice, I'm shining the light in at an angle. And you can actually watch this go along the base of the fish tank. Coming out, the other side and you focus the light along a line you've already done. Well, that might be difficult. Actually, it even might be impossible. So now we need a light source. Now I've taken my light source and I've covered it and given it a little slit as you can see. Now how do we do this? Well, we cut ourselves across, something which should be easier for you lot to do than me. And then on one side of the cross, I merely cut out the thinnest slice I can for a slit. When I've done this, I've got, press out the slit, there you are. And then I tape it around the outside of the lamp. What could be easier? Then I realised I didn't have a protractor. So, first of all, I had to make a compass. So I took a pair of scissors, I taped a pen onto it, and then I taped up the scissors so they couldn't move, so they were fixed. And this is, of course, a compass. Then I'm going to make a protractor by drawing a line, and the first thing I'm going to do is create a perpendicular, which means I divide the line straight up perpendicular, which gives us 90 degrees. Then if I subdivide or bisect the angle of 90 degrees, I get 45 degrees. There we are, that's 45 degrees. There we are, I'm writing it in cleverly. Then I subdivide the 45 degrees, and I'm gonna get 22 and a half degrees, and I can do that on both sides. And eventually, I'll build up a protractor, which has got uh, all the angles, every 12 and a half degrees. I won't have anything there or there because they're too big and too small. Too small is the worst because it means that the percentage error is very large and you want to always reduce the percentage error in anything. And then we're gonna make, cut it out and make two of them. Two is what you need. And where do we use them? Well, here is where they're used. You put the light source with the slit and the two protractors, you shine the light along one of them and you can see the light emerged in the other. Of course, it's impossible to film. I tried everything. I tried putting a little bit of a cover over. I tried everything. Of course, the most important thing is to remember the diagram with your glass block, with your normal, your line coming in and out. You've got your R and your I correctly marked and you've got your light source. Did I spell that right? I'm not sure. Actually, don't forget the protractor and call it a laser. You can't misspell laser. Look at the angles. Okay, now we're going to do the entire experiment calculation, which is basically a graph. First of all, you need to redraw the table for sine I and sine R. Don't forget, don't draw an I against R. I against R is useless. So you look them all up on the calculator, basically, and you write them all down. This is me looking them up on the calculator, which looks suspiciously like my phone. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. Let's fade out of this and fade in near you. I'm almost finished here. We'll put the last two in. Right, then we've got to plot the graph. So here's the graph. We draw in the lines, the, the L, the line down the side, and across. 
There we go. And then we have to divide them up into the appropriate sections. Sine i goes up on the y, sine r down, so that our slope is correct at the end. Goes up to 0.87, so 1 will be enough. So we go up in points until 1, 0.2s. And we use the same scale on the bottom. It's very important to start the graph from 0, 0. You must start the graph from 0, 0. Then you put in all the points. There they are. There's another one there. There you go. Yeah, no, no, you're not. Is you sure? Is that right? Oh, I think it is. Okay, you keep putting in all the points, and um, at some point you get to one which isn't correct. This is called the outlier. It's a deliberate thing that uh, he's put in to try and annoy you. So when you've plotted all the points, and I'm only going to do four good ones, they'd normally be six. You draw a line around the one which is the outlier to show that you're not going to use it. Then you use a see-through ruler. Now you want to get half the points on one side of the line and half the points on the other side of the line. There you are. And then you take a point on the line and you find the coordinates of that point. And then the slope is the y-coordinate over the x-coordinate because the other point is zero. And so you get the n refractive index and you've finished the experiment. So, what kind of supplementary questions could you be asked? Well, you could be asked, why would you draw a graph? Why not just take the averages? Well, the answer is really twofold. First of all, you eliminate outliers, those points which, as you can see, are way away from the graph. You don't have to worry about them. And also, the higher values with the smallest percentage of error have a greater effect. It's called a weighted mean, but you don't have to remember that. You just say that the higher values with a smaller percentage error have a greater effect on it. Just remember, the slope is always important. It's the slope which is nearly always the answer. And if you don't know what you're doing, find the slope.